It's hard to believe that we are nearly in the middle of the ninth month of the year, September, and if you're alive today, you need to give yourself an applause. And as you know, there's a lot of things going on. There's a verse that reminds me of where we are in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 4. Anyone who is among the living has hope. In other words, if you are alive today and you're living and you're doing fine health-wise, you have hope. It says, even a live dog is better than, off than a dead lion. Whether you have a job, whether you're not in the best of places, the fact that you are alive is a good thing. You are a live dog with a lot of hope. And one day you're going to be able to walk out of that house and enjoy the things if you will keep on track and taking care of your health. One way to do that is make sure you always wear a mask. Now, I want to talk to you today about a, a very known statement, the statement that we always hear, the elephant in the room. That statement is often used to talk about things that are so obvious but people don't see. But more than just an elephant in the room, I want to talk to you today about the elephant in the year. The shock of shocks is that we realize our bodies are important. And I want to talk to you today about our health and our bodies. It was Rick Warren who was quoted and said this. He said, I have listened to thousands of sermons on what God has to say about our souls, our minds, our wills, and even our emotions. But what once, not once, have I, had I heard an entire sermon on God's view of our bodies. Notice what he says. There's a lot of messages about your spirit, your soul, and everything else, but very few he claims, about our bodies. He goes on to say the subject was completely ignored. This is why people, most people, still have no theology of health. That's what I want to deal with today. What does God have to say about your health? There are two extremes when it comes to our bodies. The one extreme is the body obsessed, where we get the idea from Narcissus, from the mythical Greek character, where we get the word narcissistic. Now, the degrees of these vary from person to person. There are people who are absolutely obsessed, and there are people who may not be obsessed but are preoccupied by their bodies. On the other end is the people who are body abused. We also get this from the Greeks, this time from Plato, who believes in the theory of dualism or dualistic. Now, you may not be body abused, but the degrees vary from being abusive with your body to the one who neglects your body. How we look, how we eat our nutrition, how we rest, and how we make lifestyle choices determines how our bodies will look like. The question, therefore, is how do I know the right look, the right food, the right exercise, the right choices? And that's why we want to look at what the Bible has to say about our bodies. The foundational verse I'm using today is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you, have, whom, whom you have from God, you are not your own? Notice it says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. Your body, not your mind, not your soul, not your spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in your body. That says a lot about the body. It says a lot about the importance and the significance of the body, and it says is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies, therefore, have a predetermined essence. That essence is the Bible says our bodies are a temple. A temple is where you meet with God. Therefore, it elicits a certain behavior, and that behavior is purity and holiness. When you know that this body is the very temple of God, it elicits a certain kind of doing life, a way of treating it with purity and holiness. Secondly, it says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God. You are not your own, it says, for you were bought with a price. In essence, what this is saying is our bodies don't just have a defined essence, it has a defined value. I'm reminded when I think about this of this masterpiece by Claude Monet, which is about 140 years old, 130, 140 years old, which was the Argentine Basin with a single boat, which was painted in 1874. 
It was bequeathed to the National Gallery of Ireland in 1924 at the value now of 10 million euros or 11 million US dollars. Now in June 29, 2012, a man walked into the gallery and rolled up his fist and punched the painting, destroying the masterpiece and tearing it in three places. What was next was the value decreased and was lost. What they did was they put down the painting, took it down and carefully, using experts, week to week, month to month, and for 18 months, like a small jigsaw puzzle, reassembled the masterpiece with little things and little shreds of the canvas put together. And thus, after 18 months, the masterpiece was restored. My point being, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship. Well, that word workmanship means poima, which means masterpiece. Your body is a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, not bad works, good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. A masterpiece is basically something that is so valuable because it's one of a kind. Your body has very little spare parts available because it's one of a kind. In other words, it elicits a level of care and attention. Here we find a good theology from the Bible about how to treat our bodies. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, For we were bought at the price, so glorify God in your body. And there we find the three essentials for our bodies. Our bodies have a defined essence. It is a temple where we meet God, thus we should keep it pure and holy. It has a defined value. Thus, we should treat it with great care and attention. And finally, it has a defined purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God with our bodies. We all have different bodies and we were gifted with different sicknesses or, or whatever weaknesses or strengths. Whatever it is that our bodies have, we need to ask ourselves a fundamental question. We're not always going to be 100% healthy. We, my own bodies, have certain allergies, certain things that it's not capable of doing. But the question we should all ask each other is this, is my body honoring to God? That question actually prompts two more questions. Is, my behavior, is the behavior of my body honoring to God? And secondly, you need to answer that and ask yourself, are my behaviors making my body holy? Next is, is the care and attention I give my body honoring to God? Thus, am I taking good care of my body? Think about it this way. Remember, if you, what do you imagine if you bought a brand new computer, how would you treat that computer? You know that that computer will not last forever the same way that your life and your body will not be healthy forever and at one point will start to die. The same way that the computer is that you will have to treat it a certain way. You will watch and make sure that viruses don't get into it because you're watching and making sure only the pure and only the holy go into it for it to function properly. You're going to watch whatever might actually hurt it or might, you might spill into it and destroy it and you will put proper care and attention to it, making sure that at some point when it actually dies because of the time that it has to, it's not wrecked up like this. The care of our bodies is important. The right theology is based on these three essentials, a defined essence, a defined value, and a defined purpose. Now, the next point of this message says that our body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. Thus, we, need, we must fill it with the Holy Spirit. Before I answer or tell you how you fill your body with the Holy Spirit, let me remind you how you can have the Holy Spirit, particularly for those of you who are joining us and are not even familiar with who the Holy Spirit is. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. When we repent and are baptized and we confess that Jesus has forgiven our sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is kind of like something that comes in a package when we give our lives to Jesus. We fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit simply by confessing Jesus is Lord of our lives. The question, therefore, is if I already have him or the Holy Spirit, why do I have to be still filled with him? The answer is quite simple. It's really your, like your mobile phone. 
Your mobile phone is a pre-downloaded presence of an app. But whether that app fills your day is determined by whether you acknowledge the presence of that app, more importantly, if you use it regularly the whole time in the day. In short, if you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it begins with acknowledging that He is present in your life. You cannot uh, fully maximize the presence of something if you haven't even learned to acknowledge or allow it to fill your entire day. Now, further, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, a better verse to understand how it is to be filled by the Holy Spirit. It says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice it says, do not get drunk with wine, and it's contrasted with the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me tackle the first part first. It says that is debauchery. What is debauchery? a habitual, excessive indulgence on food, wine, sex, and substance. Another word for it is actually the word gluttony. Sometimes we might be doing the right things or behaving the right way or even go to the right church or doing the right religious things, but we abuse our bodies with excessive indulgence. And it says, do not do it. Notice where it says, do not get drunk and but be filled. Interesting, isn't it? It really talks about this contrast between the Holy Spirit and wine. <laughs> now, you, not, not a coincidence that when you see somebody who purveys or sells wines and spirits, because there is a huge connection. The connection is both of these fill you. Now, both of these are not going to fill you by looking at it, by talking about it, or by even hanging around people who are drunk or are filled with the Holy Spirit. For wine, you have to fill yourself regularly. For the Holy Spirit, you need to acknowledge His presence in your life. That is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It begins with the acknowledgement of His presence in our lives. But it doesn't stop there. It goes into going under His influence. When you watch people who are drunk, they're called to be people who are under the influence of alcohol. What happens is it activates a behavior that we are not usually aware of or are even capable of. You watch drunk people who start shouting and screaming and become very aggressive or become very wild, but they weren't even aware that that was in them or they were capable of it until they were drunk. Similarly, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it activates a quality of life or living that we are not aware or are capable of. That's the power of acknowledging the Holy Spirit and putting ourselves under his influence because he begins to teach us things, a quality of living we are not aware even exists or are even capable of. Next is, it causes us to forego the proper behavior and care of our bodies. That's what happens when you're drunk. People who are addicted to wine or alcohol or substances forego the proper behavior and care of their bodies. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it causes us to be sensitive to the proper behavior and care of our bodies. It's interesting how the Bible contrasts these two because the parallel is absolutely clear. Finally, when we're drunk, we're confused. It impairs and debilitates us physically. You watch people who are drunk and can barely walk. People who have the Holy Spirit clarifies the essence and value and purpose of their bodies. That's why we need to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge Him, we put ourselves under His influence, and finally, we understand His unlimited supply in our lives. When we drink alcohol or wine, drunkenness demands an ongoing consumption because its essence eventually wears off. The Holy Spirit is an inexhaustible source of life because His power never runs out. It never wears off. The key is to acknowledge Him, and secondly, to put our lives under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, in John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus explains this idea of the unlimited resource. He says, whoever believes in me, there it is, when we believe in Jesus, confess our sins, and make Him Lord and Savior of our lives, as the Scripture said, out of His heart, will flow rivers of living water. It didn't say, feed yourself with rivers. Out of your heart comes rivers of living water. In short, he was talking about the Holy Spirit. 
Now this he said about the Holy Spirit, whom believe, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. The point being, there is the unlimited supply of the Holy Spirit in our lives if we will but acknowledge him and put ourselves under his influence. Let me review for you. Our bodies have a defined essence. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thus, it elicits a certain kind of behavior. Our bodies have a defined value. Thus, it elicits the proper care and attention. Our bodies have a predefined purpose, and thus we honor God with our bodies. Next is we fill it by acknowledging Him, by putting ourselves under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and realizing His supply is absolutely unlimited. Now, the question is, how do I do that? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 captures the essence of that. It says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh or your body and your mind and your will. It says, walk by the Spirit. I want you to watch this. It says, walk by. The other one says, be filled with. There's a difference between being filled with something versus walking by something. Doing something or walking by the Spirit is a different thing, which brings us to how. How do I do this? Walk by the Spirit. Further, Galatians 5 continues in verse 16. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Notice it doesn't say that your flesh or your body will disappear. What it says is when you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your body. Your body, my body, will be us forever. If there's anything we've learned from COVID is there's no getting away from this body. We can't even go anywhere because our bodies have limits. And that's why we need to understand that this body is extremely important. It will never disappear. And the key is not to give in to it, but to cause it to follow what it was designed for, what it was purposed for, its value. And now as we do that and acknowledge the Holy Spirit, we will find we will not gratify the flesh. Now, further, it says the first step is to be decisive. Be decisive to know that I am walking by the Spirit. It says in Galatians 5.17, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. It repeats itself where it says these things are in opposition, they're contrary. That's why it requires a measure of decisiveness. Notice where it says in Galatians 5.22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit does not grow overnight. It requires being decisive to walk by the Spirit on a daily basis. Fruit is always beautiful when it's already mature and lush and sweet and nutritious. But many times we forget that fruit looks like this for a long period of time. And that's why we've got to be decisive to decide to walk by the Spirit on a daily basis is an important part of our lives as believers. Furthermore, it says not just walk by the Spirit, but be determined. Stay in that place. Be determined to walk by the Spirit because you know that over time, that Spirit will bear fruit. I want you to look at Galatians 5.22 once again, where it says, by the, by, but the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. You will find that the fruit of the Spirit is not health or holiness. Health and holiness is the result of a person who has learned to walk with the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of God, and the result of that is love. Hard to be healthy and holy when you don't have love. Hard to be healthy and holy when you don't have peace. It is almost impossible to be healthy without patience. I figured out that my reflux issues were actually a matter of patience. I tried all kinds of food supplements and medications, and for decades, nothing helped until I learned that it was chewing my food very slowly and very gently and swallowing slowly through patience that solved my reflux issues. Kindness is hard to be holy and hard to be healthy without it. Goodness and faithfulness. Faithfulness is simply being consistent with the practices, the good practices and habits that you have developed. And finally, it says in verse 23, gentleness and self-control. 
Now, you cannot be healthy and holy without these two. This year, I'm probably dealing with this issue of gentleness. Gentleness simply means not forcing your way. And I found that sometimes that's where I'm lacking. And that's why the fruit of the Spirit has to grow. It's hard to be healthy without self-control. Self-control is what brings health most of the time when we say no to practices that we shouldn't do or habits that we know are defective. Allow me to close this message by saying our bodies have a determined essence, value, defined purpose. We get there by acknowledging, putting ourselves under His influence, and trusting His unlimited supply by being decisive and determined, and finally, by being dependent. As it closes in Galatians 5.25, it says, since we live by the Spirit or walk by the Spirit or live filled with the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, he says. Keeping in step with the Spirit is simply a matter of being dependent. To know that I can't just walk alone and I have to constantly keep in step with the Spirit of God. Let me summarize and close this message for you. Our bodies have a defined essence. You and I are a temple of the Holy Spirit. It elicits a certain kind of behavior. It has a defined value, which we are masterpieces, which elicits a way of taking care and paying attention to our bodies. It has a defined purpose, and that is to glorify God in our bodies. Not a perfect body by any means. We will not be perfectly holy and perfectly healthy, but we will glorify God with what he's given us. To get there is to acknowledge him and to put ourselves under his influence and finally to understand his supply is unlimited and we don't have to keep consuming other things. To get there, we need to be decisive, we need to be determined, and finally, we need to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, as we have repented of our sins and turned to you, we thank you for giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we are grateful for the bodies you have given us. Holy Spirit, teach us to treat it as your very temple. Lord, may we care for it as the masterpiece that you made and redeemed with your precious blood. And may we glorify you in and through our bodies as you fulfill us and influence over us and have influence over us. Be glorified in our lives this day. And in Jesus' name, in your name, Lord, we pray. And everyone said, amen.